to a special presentation of Wasi literature in English for senior high schools. For those of you who do not know Wasi, Wasi is West African Secondary School Certificate Examination. In order to help students who are preparing for these exams, the A1 challenge is bringing you this ser these series of videos that will help you in your studies. Now, I, your presenter, is going to be Gideon Brody. This day, I want you to learn a few things about African poetry. The first poem we want to look at in this series is The Anvil and the Hammer. The Anvil and the Hammer is an interesting poem written by Kofi Awono. Kofi Awono, I'd like to say a few things to you about Kofi Awono. Kofi Awono is a Ghanaian poet who studied and taught literature extensively on the continent of Africa. Unfortunately, Kofi Awono died tragically during the Al Shabaab attack of the Westgate shopping mall in Kenya in 2013. I'd like to say a few things about Awono that will be helpful to your understanding of the anvil and the hammer. Awono, during his lifetime as a Ghanaian, was really known to be a traditionalist. When I say he was a traditionalist, what I mean is that he was somebody who stood by his culture, religious beliefs, and they were all based on his traditions. Well, a number of his poems are really influenced by his traditions and his belief in them. A very typical example is the anvil and the hammer. Well, I wouldn't like to bore you so much about the background of the poet because actually the background of the poet is not directly examinable, even though necessary, but not directly examinable by Wyatt or by Neko. I'd like us to have a look. I'd like us to have a look at the poem briefly. The Anvil and the Hammer by Kofi Abono. Caught between the anvil and the hammer in the forging house of a new life, transforming the pants that delivered me into the joy of new songs, the trappings of the past tender tenors woven with fiber of sisal and washed in the blood of the goat in the fetish heart, are laced with the flimsy glories of paved streets. The jargon of a new dialectic comes with the charisma of the perpetual search on the outlaw's hill. Seal the old days for us, our fathers, that we can wear them under a, a, a new garment, ourselves in the well-known of many rivers estuary. We hear their songs and rumors every day, determined to ignore these we use snatches from their tunes, make ourselves new flags and antennas, while we lift high the banner of the land and listen to the reverberations of our songs in the splash and moan, is going to be on the meaning or the message of the poem. I want you to understand one thing. Every poem has a message. Before the poet writes, he thinks of what he would like to say. He thinks of what message he would want to send across. And that helps him to structure his poem according to the message that he wants to put across. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to tell us, for instance, what is the anvil and the hammer about? Well, let's look into the meaning and a short 
analysis of this point. Well, a clue that always is very helpful, which I sometimes use, is before you understand a point, right from the beginning, you have to pay attention to the title of the poem. If you have a look at the anvil and the hammer, the title is very important. First of all, you need to understand what is the meaning of these two instruments, the anvil and the hammer. What is an anvil? What is a hammer? An anvil is a metallic object in the in the room or in the working place, in the workplace of blacksmith usually. A hammer is also another instrument that is also used by blacksmiths. So immediately you realize that in our mind we move into the blacksmith shop. But what you should understand is that we are actually not doing um, a course in technical um, uh, skills or a course in uh, blacksmith kind of work, no. We are all looking at the work of the blacksmith, but actually the poet uses these two tools or instruments basically as symbols to help him to carry out his message. If you look at the anvil and the hammer, even though the poem is written in 20 lines and it has no clear stanzas, one thing that you need to understand is that it divides itself in terms of content. If you read the content very well, you can realize that the content look that seem to be divided between lines 1 to 10 and lines 11 to 20. I'd like us to have a look at a few of these things that I'm talking about. When we say the message of the poem, sometimes you should be able to easily tell the message of the poem in a matter of a few sentences. For instance, if I say, what is the message of the anvil and the hammer? In a sentence or two, you should be able to tell me what the message is. In the anvil and the hammer, one thing that we find is an anvil and these two, as I said already, are instruments, but as I said again, these two are used metaphorically as symbols. In the anvil and the hammer, you find the poet Kofi Abuno talking about two different cultures, his own traditional culture and the modern culture that is emerging as a result of the European influence and Christian influence on, on the life of the African. Let's look at the beginning of the poem. Caught between the anvil and the hammer in the forging house of a new life. This basically lets you know that if there is some kind of suddenness, some kind of Accidental occurrence. He is only caught between the anvil and the hammer. What you should learn is that it means it is not through any fault of his. He is only caught between the anvil and the hammer. You know, let me just say a little thing about that word. Caught between. Caught between. Sometimes when, when two soldiers or two armies or the police uh, encounters, armed robbers, what we sometimes hear is some civilians are caught between the firing range. They, are, they come in between the armed robbers and the police, the police force. It is not through any fault of theirs. And so, the same way the poet says, I am caught between the anvil and the hammer. And what, what does he have to do? He is only at a certain point where he can't do anything about. But does he really not do anything about it? No. The poet or the persona tries to say something that is very interesting. His mission is to learn how to adapt. 
how to adapt to the new way of life. And this is what we want to look at. So the anvil on one hand is a representation of the tradition and the culture of the persona. And the hammer on the other hand is a symbol of the European influence that comes in terms of education, religion, especially the Christian religion, and technology. Now, if you have a look at this poem, you know that it is he's only talking about the anvil and the hammer in terms of a metaphor. If you look at line two, line two, in line two he says, in the forging house of a new life. So what we are learning this day is that the poet, would, the persona, I must say, is trying to tell, to tell us or to tell readers that he is getting into a new way of life. And what is this new way of life? The new way of education, Christian influence, technological influence on the modern African of the persona at this point is to transform his past into a new era so that he can he can adapt to the new situations that he is he, he's faced with. Talks about the pants that delivered me transforming the pants that delivered me into a new the, into joys into the joy of new songs. He talks about the trappings of the past. All these have to do with his cultural heritage and his attachment to his culture. Now, now you realize something very interesting. Whenever the persona speaks about his culture, he speaks in admiration. He talks about the attractiveness of his culture. For instance, in line 5, he says, The trappings of the past, tender and tenuous. He sees his culture as something that is very delicate, special, not like, not like what he refers to as the paved streets. Paved streets. The use of paved streets, he talks about the flimsy glories of the paved streets. Flimsy. Have you ever gone to class one day late, probably attended class late, or didn't go to school at all, and your teacher ever asked you, why didn't you come to school? And then the student says, because I, I, because I, I, I just didn't want to come. Or because my mother told me to wash all the bowls and do everything and, and, and go to town and go to Accra and go to Nigeria and go to this place. And, and, and the teacher says, hey, stop giving me flimsy excuses. Excuses that are not acceptable. Excuses that are not real. So the poet for instance says, flimsy glories of paved streets. What it means is that he looks down on these new ways of life that are coming in. The new way of the European, the new way of Christian influence, of technological influence. Even though he stands in between both his culture and the new way of life, that is the European influence, he says, well, if I look at the two, one is tender, delicate, while the other is flimsy. But what can he do? In order to adapt, he would have to merge the two. That is why he uses the word in the forging house of a new life. He has to forge these two aspects of his life to tradition that we see in this poem is he talks about how he was born. He talks about the washing in the blood. That kind of blood takes you back immediately into tradition. He mentions fetish heart, the place where when children are born, 
they, they are taken to, in, in the very traditional sense of the African man, when children are born, they are named. And so as part of the rituals of naming, sometimes an animal is slaughtered to sacrifice to the gods. And the poet or the persona still keeps this, this kind of attachment in the poem. New time or the European culture. The poet says the jargon of the new dialectic comes with charisma of the perpetual search on the Ablo's hill. The jargon of the new dialectic. Again, we find the word new, the modern way, the European way, that is exerting its influence on the persona as a traditional African. What can he do? At this point, that is by line 11, you find that the poet begins